Algorithms and Programs, Part 1. Our first objective is to explain the term algorithm and describe common methods of defining algorithms, including pseudocode and flowcharts. Now, an algorithm is just the technical term for the instructions being used to define the computer program. It makes us feel very clever in computer science to use this word when all we mean is the sequence of events. And a flowchart is a way of defining the algorithm in diagrammatical form. You'll see there we've got our terminators to start and stop the flow. We've got our process boxes, the rectangles, which describe something happening. Our decision boxes, which are the diamonds with arrows coming off it for different decisions. A subroutine box, which refers to a separate subroutine, usually in the form of another diagram. We've got our connectors, little circles, which would connect that to another diagram. I'm just using it here for an example. But we follow the order of the arrows and we follow the processes to define how the algorithm works. This is my preferred method. I often sketch these in my notebook when I'm trying to work out how to build a certain program. But there is another method, pseudocode which is an informally defined code-like language. Now I say informally, uh, despite the fact that in the real world, pseudocode is meant to look like the programming language you're using. So for instance, if you're using Java, your pseudocode will look a bit like Java. If you're using Python, it'll look a bit like Python. Uh, because of the nature of an exam, we do have a formalized definition of pseudocode that we do have to follow. However, as far as I'm aware, the exam will accept programs written in actual programming language instead of the pseudocode versions that they ask for in Wales. You see, this program is just a simple procedure that prints a list. It has a start and a stop variable, which are integers. It sets the start value to zero and continues looping in a while loop whilst the start value is less than the stop. It outputs the start value and increments it. So you need to be familiar with all of those methods and be able to read and write and edit them. The next objective is about recursion. Recursion is one of the most beautiful concepts in computer science. Uh, we need to explain the use of recursion in algorithms and programs and consider the potential elegance of this approach. Now, an algorithm that calls itself in its definition is a recursive function. We can only put together the complete answer when we reach a base case or a terminating condition. So when the answer actually outputs a value that can be returned back up the stack. Here's a classic example of recursion. I've built a factorial program and a factorial, for those of you that can't remember, is where we just multiply every value by n minus one until we've got a result. So whatever value we're given, the procedure is going to keep repeating return value times factorial value minus one. So basically it's going to say whatever this number is, multiply it by the result of the next factorial. So it can't make that sum straight away, so it needs to go off and do that. And it'll keep doing that until our base case where value is one happens. Let's see that in execution with this example. So what factorial three would do, eventually it would produce uh, this return value and it would say, right, well, we need to work out three times factorial two. What's factorial two? Well, let's go and work it out. So it would start another version of the program with a different value. This time value is not one, so we're gonna jump down, and this time we're gonna return two times factorial one. Well, we don't know what factorial one is, so we'll make another version of that. Factorial one triggers this first if condition, value is one, so it will return one. So we get the value one. Now, as that's being returned, that means factorial one is replaced with one. So that shoots up the stack, and now we can work out factorial two. Factorial two is two times one, which is two, and we can shoot that back up the stack again. Factorial two now becomes two, so that means we can work out factorial three, which is three times two, which is six, and that's our finished value. So it's considered elegant because it uses a divide and conquer strategy to break the problem down into smaller and smaller sub-problems, eventually combining the solutions together to form the final answer. And it is a simpler design and a more compact algorithm than using iteration. The only issue with it is each new recursion increases the amount of memory that we need to store the result. Our testing objective then is all about selecting appropriate test data, dry running a program or algorithm in order to identify any possible errors, including logical errors, and then explaining the purpose of a given algorithm by showing the effects of the test data. So what should test data be? How do we select it? Well, we need to select from three pools. We need valid, in other words, data that should work correctly, invalid data, data that should produce an error message that we expect to see, 
and extreme values. Extreme values are where we have any kind of range. We'll pick the lowest and largest valid values to test to make sure that we've used our less thans, greater thans, or inequality symbols correctly in our code. We also need to make sure that we test all potential code parts. Now that's reasonably straightforward in something like an app, but when we get to a video game, and especially things like open world video games where we've got almost an infinity of options, it is very difficult to make sure that we test all potential code parts. What we do when we're planning these algorithms out is we perform dry runs. And this is where we take the code and we take a table and we manually work through it line by line and document the changes to the variables as the code executes. Now this is often done on a line by line basis, but the examples we see in the past papers tend to be on iterations. We can then check that the code itself doesn't have any logic errors before we go and implement it. Dry runs happen line by line, but often at the end of each iteration in a loop, we would just record the changes to the variables. So let's see an example of that. Here's a code for a factorial function, which I've rewritten to be iterative rather than recursive. And what we're gonna do, we're gonna follow the while loop and record the iterative value each time. Now, as we're going into the while loop, the value for total is one and the value for value, whatever's entered into it. So if we start here in iteration one with a value of three, we're gonna get a total of four. And then we follow the loop back up and we see that the second iteration gives us a value of two and a total of 12. The third iteration gives us a value of one and a total of 24, whilst the final iteration gives us a value of zero and a total of 24. And you can see that it's just a case of looping through the code and seeing what changes it makes to those variables. If we don't know what the algorithm is supposed to do, this dry run data should make it obvious to us. The final objective in this playlist is to compare the algorithms. Now, until this point, when we've compared algorithms, we've used plain English to describe the differences between them. We can learn about a thing called big O notation. And this helps us determine the complexity and efficiency of given algorithms in terms of their execution time, their memory requirements, and between algorithms that perform the same task. And it's a very, very simple way of discussing how long an algorithm would take, how much memory requirements it needs, and things like that. Why do we need big O? Because you cannot describe the complexity of an algorithm based on how long it takes to execute, because this will change based on the hardware used and possibly the data set given. What we can discuss is the complexity based on how the problem scales with changes to the input data set, which we'll call N. So in other words, how does it affect the runtime of the algorithm if we double the data set, if we quadruple the data set, if we have a million times the data set that we originally put in? Now to calculate this, what we do is we take an expression of complexity and remove everything other than the indices or the multipliers of N. So in this case, what we're doing is taking the expression and removing everything other than the most significant factor that affects n. In this example, we're gonna start off by removing insignificant things, things that don't really affect n that much. So for instance, plus 42 in the grand scheme of things, if n was 100 billion, would make no difference. Similarly, the multiplier five is not gonna make a massive difference, but the indice there, n squared, is gonna make a big difference to how that scales as n increases in size. Now in code, we look to identify recursion or iteration on the original data set that has the biggest impact on the operations that need to be performed in an effort to identify how complex that is in terms of big O. Let's start going through the forms of big O and I'm going to put them on a scale of fastest to slowest. We'll start with constant complexity. Now we illustrate this with big O one in brackets. Now this means the number of operations is always the same. No matter how big the data set gets, it's gonna take me the same amount of operations to perform the action. Now in our case, the only good example of this is using a stack to push or pop. It's always gonna take the same amount of operations to put something onto the stack or take something off. Our next best case scenario is logarithmic. Will we illustrate this as big O log N? Now if you understand logarithms, they're almost the inverse of exponentials in that as n increases the size of the change in logarithm decreases so it's increasing all the time but the difference is changing every increment of n so we say here that the number of operations increases logarithmically to the size of the data set and an example of this could be binary search 
In third place is linear, and this is where the number of operations scales linearly. Now this is where n is the predominant factor. So if it was 5n or 57 or 4 million n, it doesn't matter. n is the predominant factor that makes a big difference to the size of the data set and the complexity of how it's going to work it out. And a good example of this is simple search. If the data set of simple search is five, we may have to look at five things. If it's five billion, we may have to look at five billion things to find the item. There's another logarithmic then, but you can see this time it's logarithmic with a multiplier because it increases logarithmically and linearly. So it's big O, N log N. And this means that N impacts in two ways. Now an example of this is quicksort. Polynomial then, which is a little bit worse than that, which is where the data set N is, well, the data set N has an indice. In this case, we'd, we'd write it as big O, N to the C, where C is the power that we raise it to. For instance, N squared, N cubed, and so on. And that's the number of operations increases to a fixed polynomial from the data set. For example, selection sort works with this. Now the very worst case scenario, which we want to avoid at all costs, is exponential, where the size of the data set is actually the indice. And this is where the number of operations increases exponentially with the exponent size of the data set itself. The traveling salesman problem, which isn't in your specification, but is a classic computer science problem, give it a search, it'll be very interesting for you, I promise, is one of these exponential problems. And as we increase the data set by one, the size increases enormously. So let's take a look at how this might be affected by real numbers. And for this, I'm gonna take a data set N of size 20 as a test set. So a constant set of operations, and that's arbitrary, that might be three operations. That doesn't have anything to do with N, so it's just a number. Logarithmic, so log 20 is 1.3 operations or 1.3 seconds, it's 1.3 something. Linear is the size of N itself, so it's just 20. Logarithmic actually gives us 26 in this case. Polynomial gives us 400. And exponential gives us 1,048,576. You can see there why you want to avoid exponential big O because the amount of time it would take to process that, or the amount of memory requirements it would take for that, are ridiculously huge compared to the rest. Polynomial is bad enough for the data set of 20. Logarithmic is significantly more than linear. What we ideally want to have is constant or logarithmic. And if we just put all those graphs together to see them on top of each other, you can see what that looks like. And you can see the green then, which is the exponential data set, shooting up to the top of the axis much quicker than its peers.